Welcome everybody. Welcome on behalf of Mountaineering Island. My name is Anya. Uh, I work as a woman in sport in Mountaineering Island and today uh, we have Chloe from John, our female role model, despite being very young. Um, so thank you so much that you are here, Chloe. Ambrose said, what was the experience like to be filmed for the OEA experience? No pressure. Uh, there, there's just so many answers to it. There's like the before knowing I was going to get filmed and there's a being on the island. You know, there's like the month before, before you get to Donegal, then there's being in Donegal before we went to the island and then there's being on the island. And then there's like failing where I thought I had a route and I didn't have a route. And then there was like having the route. So it was like, it was all really intense was the answer, I guess, intense. Um, yeah, but it was really good. Like, I learned a lot. I've kind of got a habit of uh, if something really scares me or intimidates me, then I, I kind of have to say yes because I feel like I need to like need to deal with it because you kind of learn a lot from throwing yourself. At. If you don't want to do it, then there's a reason you don't want to do it, and you can overcome that like issue in yourself. I guess if you do, it. I don't know, but yeah, I just say yes to things. That's essentially it. But uh. Yeah, it was good. It was really good. It, it always works out where you're like, you're terrified of something and you think you're going to like say something really dumb or do something really dumb. But then uh, in like after you do it, you realise it was all like fine. There was nothing really worth stressing about. It was kind of just one of those experiences really. So I, I could like talk about it forever. So if you, if you want more. How did you find uh, like recording? Did the camera bother you or? drone or no like that part was actually really easy um it was see it was all it was really different so the route i did it was the first time that i've ever worked a route that i've ever i, I went down and i knew the moves and i knew the gear i didn't know if i could do it all together and i didn't know if i could like i guess hold myself together mentally like you need to untrad you know you, you never know if you're gonna like flip out that's kind of like the appeal of it but um mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the first time I did that. So I was going down to do a route where I knew it was ahead of me. And when I started climbing, it was like all these anxieties that I usually get on a normal trad route where uh, I'll be climbing and the only thing that breaks my climbing zone will be worrying about like, am I going to get gear up ahead? Or am I going to run out of gear? Am I going to, is the climbing going to get so hard? So I'm always kind of worrying about those things. But suddenly when you red point a trad route, um, point trad route then uh, you know what's coming so when I climbed that route more than like any route I've ever done I was totally in the climbing zone the entire time I, I never really noticed the guys filming there was two of them uh, one was like directly above me for most of the route so I started like down here and he was up here there's kind of like a hanging slab and he was like on top of that the entire time and I got up and I did this like I'd do the move where it was like, you know, kind of like a you no know, hand rock over you, like take your hands off, you like lean over. And he was right above me. And I think they were wondering if that was going to be a problem, but I didn't even notice because I was so in the zone. So yeah, it was great. That was easy. And um, the rest of it was tricky, like the interviews and talking and trying to put into words like what a climbing is you and what your experiences are so far. And all that stuff is hard, but the climbing part was pretty easy. That's impressive that, you know, your worries were just around like what to say, how to behave, not like how to climb or uh, pick a route. Uh, the nature is, you know, we, it's just, it just looks like the place is so inaccessible and wild. It's just impressive what you guys did. And may I ask how it actually came to, to this, like, how did you form the expedition? Whose idea was it? Uh, so that was all the guys at Coalhouse. Um, they, they wanted to make a, a film about climbing on the west coast of Ireland. And they just, they messaged Damien from out near Ireland asking for like a bunch of climbers. So I kind of did nothing really. I was just there and I climbed. Um, so loads of people have said to me like, well done in the movie and stuff. But I kind of feel like I didn't make it or anything. I just climbed and I, I went there. And there was like a ball of nerves and then they like climbed. But uh, 
yeah, they they like what they did was really impressive. They pulled it all together and they they kind of navigated the the situation with the locals because coming out like going to any island, like a quiet island, as like a film crew from outside the country, like that's a really difficult task to undertake. Um, but they did it, and I think I think they kind of managed to. We we all came to the understanding that like the guys that were doing it, they had really solid interest behind them. They were like really good people, and they really cared a lot about the island, and they were just like really sound people. Um, kind of gone totally off topic, but yeah, it was it was them, and they just recruited all of us in. They wanted a bunch of Irish climbers, which I think is actually really cool. Um, they didn't like pick a bunch of like elite climbers that are like regularly in movies or anything. They wanted to pick a, like local climbers that they thought would be like fitting into the place. Mm -hmm. We are lucky to have you um, and we were lucky to see you in the movie. Here in Ireland we hear so much about climbers from abroad, uh, even from UK or from USA, loads of female climbers, male, male climbers, teenage climbers, but we, we don't really hear about our own uh, Irish-based, Irish-born climbers and it was really good for a difference to see the faces you're familiar with, like yours, Kevin, Michelle, Connor, um, that was really good. I think many people wanted to, to see you and were very happy to see you guys because it shows that there's so much going on in Irish mountaineering and it always has been. It's just people don't really talk about it or the media don't talk about it. And it would be great if that was changed. Yeah. We started uh, at uh, 7 uh, already, so some of you possibly missed a little bit. So uh, we are broadcasting obviously from Chloe Fran and featuring Chloe's plan. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess it's the perfect venue uh, for uh, chatting to, to Chloe, to a climber. Um, if you have any questions, please put them into chat. Me and Chloe, we are looking at the questions and we already started with Ambrose's uh, question. But to be honest, I would like to ask Chloe, uh, why do you climb? Why? Um, I guess, yeah, like obviously, like I really, like I love climbing. That's like the obvious answer. But I think the first thing that really got me about it was um, the movements, so the first time I climbed would have been in UCD. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to go in and like, I did a lesson, like a top rope lesson that James Byrne, I think, did my belay test. But uh, yeah, just a movement like totally blew my mind at first that you were, you were like going off this wall and you were making all these shapes and it was like a puzzle you could like solve on your way. And that was amazing. I loved it. But like, I was already hooked by then. But then uh, I, I think because I loved it so much, it made it really easy to blend into the more experienced people in the club. And I got lucky and I just kind of like forced myself into like every trip that was going. So like anywhere anyone was going, I like I had to go. So it was like Wales or the Moorins or Fairhead. And I, I didn't really, I didn't learn to lead climb until like a year, year and a half, half in. So I kind of just tagged along and I think they all were happy to just have someone to like go with them. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just like be happy to have someone second them on a route and it was, it was mostly guys like Paul and Connor and Neil and stuff and they'd all like bring me up a route and I just I'd be out in this rock just like making all these shapes and I'd look around and the sea would be behind me and yeah it just, it just blew my mind it was like a different world to everything else going on um, yeah that that blew my mind and then as I went on, I like got more and more invested in it. I guess now it's kind of like climbing is like an outlet for like, there's all this stuff going on in the world that like, like I find like stressing me out loads, but like climbing is like the one thing that I can do and enjoy and focus on. And um, sometimes I think it's a bit of a, like it's definitely self-indulgent sport. Mm. But uh, yeah, for me, it's just like, it's an outlet, I guess. Yeah. How long have you been climbing? Um, when I, like, I would have first gone into the wall about, 
about seven and a half or eight years ago. Um, then I would have started lead climbing about six or six and a half years ago. Um, it was kind of like a slow thing when I first started. I got like a back, a bad back injury, and like it totally didn't scare me off. That like that was that was it for me. I was like, I want to get back at this. It's like, and I loved it. So that like kind of set it back for years. So even though I started eight years ago, if, in my head I haven't actually started it until like five years ago. Um, yeah, and then it was like I was terrified and gripped and scared, and I kind of hated it for. For two or three years, I like I hated it loads because I found I got really scared and like certain aspects of it, and then I had to like overcome that. And then when I overcame that, I actually started like loving it again, and now I love it. It's like up and down. Yes. What do you think? Uh, what do you think about when you climb? Oh, I try really hard not to think. Um, like I try so hard not to think. That's the, the hardest part about it. I, I find, especially from climbing inside a lot, I've got all of these really like efficient movement patterns and strength. And um, even if you don't fingerboard a train, like if you climb inside, you've got surplus strength for what you need outside. Um, so you have all that. And then for me, the problem is if I start thinking, then it takes away from that. So I'll start thinking about like, I don't know about like, oh, I'm not sure about that last piece of gear or I'm not sure what's ahead of me and stuff. So I try really, really hard not to think. And if I do think, then I actually fall back to like thinking this is so much easier than anything I've done inside. So that's mm -hmm. like my fallback is like, I imagine like, I kind of like pick a route that I've done in the past couple of months inside that I know is physically harder than any trad route I've ever done in Ireland or probably ever will do in Ireland. Um, and I just think about that and think this, this is easier than that. And I didn't fall off that. So if I need to, I, I think about that. I do have like a mental checklist that I run through. Mm -hmm. the that really helps. But then when I'm on route, I try try not to think. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, people are really interested in it. I'm really interested in it. Um, what to what to think? How to help myself when I climb? And I'm super scared uh, when I'm above the gear. I want to look at it as like a like a wide picture of is it like you want to get over your fear of falling in like a specific scenario or are you scared in other scenarios and then what i did was i picked like the lowest hanging fruit which was kind of bouldering and um, bouldering and indoor indoor lead climb i picked those two and i was like what can i do to like get over them and then i worked on it in a really safe controlled way so i take like a fall from in a really safe controlled environment i take like you probably wouldn't even call it fall, but it was essentially like a top rope fall. And in Boulder, and I'd like, I just start off by like climbing up and down the easy stuff over and over again, where my session would basically be climbing up and down all the easy boulder problems. And it was kind of this like thorough, but easy and consistent approach that like got me over. Um, then you like escalate it up, I guess. So, um, you see, you've got like multiple platforms that you're afraid of. you've got to like work on one of them and then like keep trying to like build them all up a little bit and then you reach a point where your brain realizes actually all these things that I was scared of I don't really need to be scared of and then they like kind of come together for me I have to work in all those to get over my fear of trash mm -hmm. so it's not just one thing it's a few elements and um, how long did it take you to like overcome that fear or overcome enough to actually climb outside and project outside? Um, it's hard to say, like I still get it. So now if I'm, uh, now if I'm like particularly stressed, I won't go char climbing or I won't do anything hard. So say like the past few months I've been working a lot, like really hard and my stress levels have been a bit high so I'm going to like really gradually ease back into track climbing because I know mm -hmm. that my mental capacity for stress is like really low so that's a factor you got to consider um, but yeah it's kind of hard to say because it like it comes and goes a lot um, and yeah. track climbing it was pretty it was pretty steadily increasing um, you were asking earlier about like what I did to overcome fear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just it is like hard to answer because I feel like there's like a lot of different tools for like getting over.
over it. One of the, the big things if you're talking about trial climbing fear, um, I made a checklist that I'd run through before I started each route and for me this is like the biggest thing that, that like that had the biggest effect. I don't know where I read it, I like read it or someone recommended it. But I had a checklist and I sat down for like two hours and I thought about what are like what are the biggest things that like cause fear and hold me back when I'm trial climbing. And I think I still have the list somewhere but on it was I realised I wasn't using my feet. So when I was climbing inside, I was like using my feet and trusting and standing on these tiny puddles. But I'd get mm-hmm. outside and be on a massive ledge and I'd still be like this, like locked off and gripped. So I realized if I actually really used my feet, then I'd be saving like all that like pump and stuff. So that was like the first thing. Um, the next thing was uh, I found a lot what would happen is I'd place a piece of gear and I'd place it and I'd be like, yeah, that's a good piece. And I'd move up and suddenly like, a meter, a half meter later, I'd be like, oh, that piece wasn't great. I better get another one. And I'd like convince myself that the last piece wasn't great and it won't hold. And then I'd get another piece. And then I'd get really pumped. Like that would like keep happening. So I'd be playing yeah. like 50 pieces a year. But uh, so that was another thing. So I convinced myself that, uh, or I told myself I have to convince myself at each piece of gear that it was good or I had to rate it so at each piece of gear I have to assess the piece really thoroughly and make like a definitive decision on how good that piece was so that when I move off I can say nope you decided back down there so you gotta stick with that decision and uh, yeah that was really important then another one was I made a rule that I'm not allowed to place another piece until the last piece is at my feet because it depends like this is obviously all circumstantial but Generally, I find like I would have three or four pieces within like my body length, and it was just unnecessary because a lot of them yeah. were like eight to ten out of ten. Talking about uh, dealing with fear, you're talking about stuff that I think everybody's guilty guilty of uh, putting loads of extra pieces of gear and then uh, trying to move up above, jamming it so the second there cannot actually pulling out. I'm guilty of that myself. On many, many occasions. And um, to be honest, because of COVID, I think many people possibly didn't go climbing yet. Um, people have different circumstances. And I think this, what you said, is such a valuable lesson and information how to deal with that fear um, and how to overcome it and just try to be rational and try to start easy, I guess. I guess that's the message. Maybe make the checklist. I think that's a great idea. Either it's a checklist physically on the piece of paper or in a head. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, but I guess if you're doing a checklist, it's just, you've got to be like honest with yourself and like put a bit of time into it and sit down and really think like, what are like, what are, if you're en route and you're scared, what are like the most important things you think would like would help you in like overcoming it? Because it's not you can make a chest a checklist for when you're on the bottom, like but you need a checklist for when you're on route. You know, so like all the little like traps you're gonna fall into, you need to kind of find ways of like steering yourself out of those traps. And for me it took I, I don't know if I had like the first iteration of the checklist was was really helpful, but I kinda of, like fine tuned it and now I feel like when I go on route I might not apply five out of five but I've kind of got five things you can't have like loads because you're, you're not going to do them all but I kind of find like two out of five if I work with like two out of five then suddenly my try time is way more enjoyable and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay we're gonna go uh, with next question it's from Gerard O'Sullivan uh, you have progressed through a lot of climbing grades which grade transition was hardest or opened up to most new routes to you? Did you have a sporting background before moving into climbing? Uh, E2 to E3, I think, was 100% the hardest for me. Um, I fell off a lot of E3. Um, I still fall off E3. E3 is just a hard grade. Um, it's a grade that's really easy to get pumped placing gear. Um, then I kind of, so with grades, I, I did progress through a lot of grades, but I also, I started, because I didn't jump straight into track climbing in college, I kind of started climbing in second year of college. A lot of people are climbing, like they were already on E1 to E2, and I seconded them. So when I started track climbing, I was like 
really eager and like pushing it really hard to like to catch up with them. So I definitely like skipped like a lot of the lower grades. Um, but it just meant that I got like really pumped and fell off a lot of me ones and me twos. But I had like a really solid group of people around me, I guess, to, to do that with. Um, mm -hmm. It was like a really safe environment to, to do it. Um, so I can't actually say like, I wouldn't say I had a standard progression from uh, from like speed if upwards right up to like E4 because it kind of dived in. I like really wanted to get on E1 straight away. Um, and I dived in and I kind of just kept sandbagging myself until I could do it. Um, but yeah, I did find E2 to E3 really hard. And sporting background, I've never like competed or anything or done any like elite sports, but I have always done sports, like every sport you could think of, I guess, in school. I've always been pretty active, hyperactive, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Eleonore Ali, Conroy uh, has a question to you. Chloe, do you have any projects in sight? In mind? Uh, yeah, like I've got a few, like I really want to do Divided Years. Um, that's one that like has been on my list for a while. Um, but I, as opposed to like, I guess having, I, I kind of want to do that cause it, like it just, it looks amazing and I know a few people that that have done it and they've all like they've all like re recommended it. But uh no, I kinda just wanna like keep building on um on my skills I guess. So to me like if I go if I were to go climb like an E seven tomorrow, then it wouldn't really feel right to me because I feel like I was just like cheating and skipping it because I haven't done like in like bunch of E six. So I wanna like consolidate each grade as I go because it's about feeling good at each grade. It's about being able to go up the route and feel like you had the skills to to make it all like come together as opposed to like just climbing it and like you've got this like you can say you've done an E seven but like really in the like in your heart you kinda know that you're you're not like you're not that good, you know. Um I, I wanna like know that I can control my mindset to like get myself up to certain difficulties. So in terms of projects, I've got like a few minor ones, but uh, like I've got some, one of each discipline, I guess. But I wouldn't say it's like a major focus for me. It's more like I want to keep building my experience. Um, but yeah, in terms of projects, there is like divided years. I've got like kind of like a trad route in every crag. Um, like there's a ton of E4s and E5s in the burn say that I haven't done and my goal this year would be to like try to take off as many of those as I can. Um, in bouldering I've done like almost no bouldering so I just want to do a bit of bouldering so I could essentially say that I'm a boulder and kind of believe it. Um, uh, sport climbing, I just want to go to Spain and find some projects I guess. And yeah. climbing the sun. <laughs> Climbing the sun. I, I like climbing in Ireland, but I totally Spain is where I want to climb. So. Yeah, I I agree actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lovely. Okay, so uh, Kyle, uh, what stop of Chloe's climbing wish list for I for Irish climbs? So that's kind of connected, I guess. Yeah, I, like I could elaborate more into it. Uh, Top of the list. Um, it, to be honest, it's really hard to answer. Like, I've got a couple of routes in Fairhead, like Wall of Braid and Mask. There's loads of classic routes that I haven't done. Um, so, I just I really want to go do all of those. And OE is, OE is 100% the top of my tick list. Uh, I just want to go back to OE. And I, I kind of love to spend the whole summer in OE. I was planning on being there like right now basically. But uh yeah, that that's that's the top. In the burn there's a bunch of routes on mirror wall that I haven't done. Shark bait and again like loads of classic routes. And bouldering, I'm working on rebel wall at the moment. That's my current bouldering project actually. And um, it's like pretty hard, but it's like the first hard boulder that I've engaged with. So I'm like really enjoying it. I'm like going out and it's like work one move for like four hours and it's really hard but really good. 
Okay, then the next question from Eva, and uh, it's a little bit um, connected to what we already said, but anyways, uh, how do you move out of your comfort zone onto the next climbing grade? Um, so let me find it. Well, on to the next climbing grade. Um, so I really consolidated the grade first. So say before I tried my first E4, I climbed like quite a lot of E3s uh, and to the point where like I do an E3 and I felt like, okay, that was kind of okay. Um, and then what I do is I pick an E4. I'd ask around, so I'd ask people about like a certain E4 for them to recommend one one that has like really good gear. I try to pick one that's really safe for the grid. Um, that's basically, yeah, that's, that's how I do it. I'd ask for one that would be really solid on the grid or like really, not solid, but safe. So my first E4 I think was trapped in the top. Um, I think that was it. And I get like quite a lot of like information, like not details about the gear, but I like, I really ask, because it depends who you ask. Like, if you ask one person, they might tell you like, it's really safe, and you ask someone else, they'll tell you like, it's totally not safe, or like a really, uh, really spicy crux or something. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I get like really solid information on it, and then I'll like do that for a couple of it, and then after that, you can kind of start like making your own assessments of it because the guidebooks are good, but they're not always like the best way to go. And then I'll never go near like say Dalky is not a place I'd ever push my grid. It depends on the crag as well. So I'm fair I know that like, I'm pretty happy pushing my grid there. The burn hit and miss, like if you pick an E3 in the burn, you could you, you could end up in, in a bad way with like some of the starts if you like push yourself like too high in the grid. Um, so it just it depends on the crag. I'll like yeah. pass around a lot, kind of. And sometimes I'll second it. So that's another thing that I've done is like I climb with Neil quite a lot and he's he's pretty solid and trad and he's kind of always operating a bit above me but even if Neil wasn't there like I'd make sure that I second someone on harder grades first. I did a lot of that when I started climbing like for the first year of track climbing I seconded people all the time so when I came in I said I jumped into like E1 but when I did that I'd actually already seconded like tons of E1s and E2s that the guys mm -hmm. were climbing like be like taking out your gear and um, I think seconding is really, really important. It's kind of hard to to overstate uh, the importance of that because you're taking out gear. Um, it's kind of the best way to like learn what good gear is. Obviously, yeah. really seconding someone is pretty solid. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I actually had a question uh, to you. Um, do you have a set of people you climb with or who's your favorite uh, kind of climbing partner? Is it really important to have somebody uh, that you can rely on or you can just climb with anybody uh, on a day, whoever turned up onto the crag? What I, is it? I, I think there's like two, two, two categories of people, um, like people that can climb with anyone and people that can't, I'm definitely someone that can't. So, yeah, like if I was second in someone, I'd be pretty happy second in a lot of people. So in terms of me leading, uh, I, I like really need to know that the person at the bottom is switched on and that like no matter what happens at the bottom, they're going to be focused on like doing like what they're supposed to be doing. So like feeling safely or whatever it is um, and assessing the situation. So like if you're in a hard trot route, you can't, you don't just apply the same focus the whole way throughout your route because someone could be in a route for like two hours. I, I climb really slowly so I know that uh, if someone were to just apply the same level of focus the whole way through the route then it's probably not going to be a really high level of focus. You need to know that someone can like assess, engage a situation and like apply the focus like relative to like how the climbing is going. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, so for me I need, I'll form like a small but really stable group of people in my head that I can climb it and I won't really step outside of that. I'd rather not climb and climb with someone that, that I don't really know and it doesn't matter 
doesn't really matter if I like their experience level. I just I I need to have seen them in action. Really, so that's the thing for me. I need to have like watched how they like how they belay, how they like time and decisions they make, and stuff. That's like really important. So Neil would be my like number one be there. But I do like a few other people that mm -hmm. that I definitely be happy holding their own. Yeah. Yeah. Your ideal job lifestyle. Uh, I guess it's not that hard. Ideal job or lifestyle. I kind of, I'm kind of pretty happy with my lifestyle. I think, uh, for now anyway. Like I, I definitely never want a, like for me, I don't want a desk job. It doesn't work for me. I need to be doing something where I'm active and constantly mentally challenged. So I need to like have obstacles to overcome. Mm -hmm. If I don't have obstacles, then I'll just get restless and probably create obstacles. But uh, I, yeah, it needs to be like challenging and engaging, ideally a bit mentally and physically. Um, yeah, I feel like what I'm currently doing kind of takes those boxes. And mm -hmm. I need to have like flexible time off to to go climbing and stuff. I couldn't work a job. I couldn't personally. I can't fathom not being able to take time off to go mm -hmm. like travel or climb or something that that's really important to me yeah yeah i guess it's hard and then recently you've been helping or working in awesome walls and trying to re repaint and everything i remember when i called you i actually thought you were painting at home and you <laughs> was like no 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 i'm painting the walls you know some walls and i was like oh my god that's actually a lot of walls to paint like good luck with that yeah um, yeah, I really enjoy working really, really hard. Like, I enjoy working too much. Like, it's, it's not healthy. I enjoy having these, like, challenges to overcome and stuff. So I'll enjoy working really hard. And then I'll take, like, about time off and go, like, enjoy it and de-stress and do things mm -hmm. I like doing. And then I'll actually look forward to coming back to work. To come back. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's, like, alternating. Okay. Another question from Ambrose. It's about work as well. As a root setter in Awesome Walls, when you finish a set and test them, do you find yourself watching the public climbing your roots? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's actually something that when I first started setting, I felt like I, I think it's really important to do that. So if you don't if you don't watch people climb it, then you don't know like how you've done it. It's like a self assessment sort of thing. But there is like a there is like a problem to it. obviously like if you you're going to set like say if you set like nine to five then you could spend like two hours which is essentially like more work watching people on the climb and you watch like are they enjoying it or not enjoying it and you really want to ask them but like obviously people feel like you know like who wants to offend someone or like hurt someone's feelings so it can be hard to like to talk to people about it Um, for me it's really important but I'm trying to actually he's back on doing it a little bit because um, mm -hmm. yeah I guess like people don't really want to I'm kind of aware that if you're if you're if I'm a climber and there's a root setter and they've set something and they're watching then I'm kind of aware that they're there and I don't want to like disappoint them if I'm really hate the climb then you don't want to like make it really obvious to hate it or you're not comfortable talking to your friend about it so you've got to kind of be a bit aware of that that like even though like I'm not very I'm not I don't get like personally attached to it so I very much want to like analyze it and figure out like what's wrong with it if someone doesn't like yeah. it yeah so yeah then I, I want them to be comfortable like they're in an environment where they don't need to feel like they've got to like hold their tongue and um, so trying to get the balance is really hard but mm -hmm. try to get like get a bit of both yeah did you ever uh I know like in root setting sometimes Sometimes you really enjoy to set something and there is this particular move that you want people to do. And then you observe the people climbing it and then they by bypass that move. Do you feel like, no, I'm going to come back and I'm going to reset it again because I want people to do that move. Have you ever, something like this, did you ever have such situation that, uh, no, I'm going to add or remove or change the position of, of the hold because you wanted to have that move? The, oh, I accidentally led them into a sequence that was really not nice or not pleasant. Mm -hmm. and it ended up like making some hideous like shape where they're all, yeah, they're all yeah. like 
if it or if it's like really reachy or if there's something like that if i feel like it's detracted from your experience then i 100 percent feel compelled to fix it or if i feel like say if you've got a, a circuit system and the difficulty is supposed to be a certain target and one problem is like way off then uh yeah i feel like a bit compelled to like fix it but uh, generally when it comes to moves no because one thing i've learned is that people just do things in all sorts of ways so everyone's like yeah. different sizes and different strengths so you kind of have to like if you go into the attitude of trying to like make someone do what you want them to do then they're probably most people are probably just not going to have the time especially because i'm quite a, like small i'm quite a, like i guess i'm not in the the average person in terms of like size and style and stuff Another question from Gerard. How do you cope with no climbing lockdown? Great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, like, so I've been working in climbing like full time for, like working in climbing and climbing and training for like a couple of years now and I find it really hard to make myself stop and take a break. I've only ever taken like two or three breaks where I don't climb for more than like a month or two, um, mm -hmm. um, particularly with like root setting, uh, it's pretty like physical. But I found it like it's like a detox where I had to, I had all this like all this energy and stuff that used to go into slime, and I had to like figure out another way of dealing with it and stuff. So I started like running, and yeah, I just I enjoyed it. It's like a break. I think it's really good for your body to not focus on one thing for so long. So I get pretty obsessive with climbing, like I, I do it a lot. And, probably a bit too much so for me it was a really good break mm -hmm. um, you just have to if you do find like you've got stressed and finding another outlet is almost a good thing because if you get injured from climbing then you've already dabbled at like another another thing so for me it was like a uh, running and a little bit of, we got these like inflatable kayaks so we can we could almost call ourselves kayakers but we're totally not but uh yeah i enjoyed it yeah mm. Um, a little bit different question now. Um, do you have people that you learn from? Any role models, anything or anyone who inspires you and how? Yeah, uh, so I feel like I kind of I kind of have this like a uh, compulsive thing almost where like I want to surround myself with people that are better than me at everything. Um, like in a way that's kind of what like accelerated my path in try climbing was when I started climbing I saw all these people uh like Paul and Neil and Connor and they're all operating like way above me and I was like oh I want to go climb with them because they were so good it really impressed me and it kind of just adapted that's just kind of like moved forward over the years and um, so I feel like there, there's just a lot of people that like I really respect in Irish climbing they could like list out like a bunch of them but uh yeah i feel like there's a really solid good pool of people in ireland for climbing and they're like really accessible and easy to talk to and you wouldn't get that in a lot of countries where the people that like the majority of the climbers in a certain country respect a certain person and they wouldn't be so like accessible and easy to talk to but ireland's different and mm -hmm. for me that's like really important so like I joined Del Rita two years ago and I got to know like a lot of people like Calvin and Claire and like Damien O'Sullivan and Dave and Caroline. There's there's like a ton of people and then there's my friends Paul and Connor. Like Connor McGovern is like yeah, it's funny to explain how good Connor is at Simon, but I feel like Ireland's just like full of these really inspiring people and it's really easy to, to get to know them and chat to them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you said that uh, you climb a lot with uh, people who are better than you. Do you do a special training? Do you have a routine or a schedule within the week and setting goals, anything like that, that will prepare you for, you know, the harder climbs so you can climb with your role models? Um, not so much like that, but I guess, um, like Jared asked earlier if I was in sports, um, I guess when I think back on it, I, I really was, like when I was in 
fifth year of secondary school and um, I got it in my head that I wanted to train for a triathlon so I became like super healthy and, like I only ate vegetables all the time and drank orange juice and I thought that was like the best thing ever and I went to the gym and I, I spent like three or four hours in the gym like training for this triathlon so I've always been really into um, I guess pushing myself physically and feeling like I'm putting myself in a position to push myself and I, I've always like so I did used to go to the gym and I kind of just took that and brought it to climbing. I've also I grew up with like two brothers and uh, like just two brothers and I think in a way like older brothers and I was always like I, I don't know if that's it but I think it developed a really strong sense of competition with guys so I don't get like too competitive with like women but if I see like a guy doing something then I feel really compelled to go like either outdo them or like keep up with them mm-hmm. and like that kind of has been like a massive driving force in climbing because when I started uh, it was mostly guys that I climbed with and who really wanted to keep up with them and the only way I found it really hard mentally to to work on what I need to work on but I knew that I could physically work on it so I do like loads like pull-ups and fingerboarding I had no idea what I was doing I just kind of did it there was no like system to it and then I started working at awesome all and met like more people that knew more about training and I just constantly if there was someone that I thought knew something I'd pick their brain about it and get their opinion and kind of like combine it all uh, over the years so now I do like I was haven't in the past I've kind of just taken a break the whole lockdown thing um, but I'll probably start again pretty soon I would like January train like two or three days a week and like fingerboarding but it's mostly climbing like I just think Mm-hmm. like I really enjoy climbing inside I enjoy just go I'll go round and round and like on a circuit board or uh, I'll do like laps on routes like four back to back routes and stuff and I feel like it's so good for you for you for so many reasons like mentally and physically and your technique and stuff so as opposed to training I guess like climbing like mileage inside I find really helpful mm-hmm. and uh, you said that you're mostly climbing with uh, men not why not with women uh, when I started, there weren't there weren't really many female climbers around um, in ECD. It's kind of totally changed in the past couple of years. But um, I would say, like in the group of people that I like started with in college, um, I was definitely like the most psyched and eager first, and I was the one that was like most out in trips and stuff. And it wasn't really until I went off and all that I started encountering like female like women that were that were pushing themselves and climbing really hard. So I see like Lucy and Caroline and Claire and like they were kind of like these like three driving forces that like kind of like propelled me forward. So they were like really important for me. They they made me realize that like as much as as hard as I've been working on it and like I felt like it was making progress when I saw what they were doing. I, I definitely like like kept going forward. They like really drove it home that like you could keep progressing and stuff because um, I always felt behind the guys but it was kind of a good thing so that it could be like working for it felt like I was ahead and I don't know if I would have worked as hard mm-hmm. yeah uh, I, I guess it can be accelerating as well because you're looking into some level and you want to just match it what would you think about uh, women's position in climbing do you think can you see any changes or throughout the years when you started you said that there were not many women and even in the UCD in the club there were not many women uh, what do you feel now? Uh, it's definitely you? changing like it's gradual I think um, it's hard to even say why it's but like there is there is definitely a massive thing like it's intimidating and hard and I think women are way more prone to like analyzing things and that does cause like you know like say bouldering like you'll see a lot more guys in the bouldering floor like pushing themselves and falling off but you'll see way less women and I did like I've like dabbled in women's coaching a bit and I have found that like women get like way more scared they like analyze it and they'll think like they'll imagine all the things that can happen to you when you fall off Mm -hmm. and I do think that's like quite like an inherent biological thing that's really hard to override but then there's like a lot of like shame and guilt and embarrassment that comes with it and it'll just happen but it'll be like really slow 
to like development like women's climbing because they've got like a lot of hurdles to overcome I think and just if I look at myself relative to the guys like the things I think on a roof compared to them like they don't imagine like your like foot jam getting like like stuck in a crack and you're flipping upside down and like breaking your leg they don't really like imagine those things they just kind of like just stick your foot in and go um yeah I just think it'll take time and women have got to see other women deal with all that and like work through it and it will happen and it is happening but it's just slow but I think mm-hmm. it's like quite a natural thing it's kind of something I used to judge myself for and hate myself for and think it was like personal defect and then I realized oh it's not kind of okay you can learn to work with it next question from Jane uh, what are the benefits of climbing as the strongest in the team compared to climbing with stronger climbers? Um, I think there. Now I, I don't know a lot about this, but uh, there 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 has been like studies about like um the, like people say like skill pools among people. Like if you enter. If you enter a certain industry and the like skill pool is at like a certain level, you like automatically there is not to it. It's like the the same thing kind of applies. I just feel like if you enter an environment and you're surrounded with people that are better than you, of course you're gonna to wanna to get better. Like you're always gonna to wanna to get better. But if you are climbing with people that are at the same level or a little bit below, you're just not gonna like push yourself as much. Um or you're gonna hold yourself back. Um yeah, I, like it is really important. I've seen it. Like I can see it with say like myself and Neil bouldering. Neil's way better than me at like bouldering and track climbing. I'd probably be better than him at sport climbing, but in terms of like Irish climbing, he's a lot better. And it's a tube of author climbing. I know for a fact that he would perform better if he were to go climbing with like Connor or like Paul or like one of our other friends that are like like a little bit like at the same level or higher than him. Um, so I've like I've kind of like seen it firsthand, and for me I find the same thing. If I see someone like doing something, it it just inspires me. Like, it's, yeah, I I think it is really important. We don't necessarily need to climb with someone. You just need to put yourself in like that environment. Mm-hmm. You need to be in the right place. So you need to like go into a wall and like pick the steep wall and like climb with people that are climbing steep stuff. And they might not be like the best of it, but they're like they're doing it, and they're like they're like enjoying it if you're there then you're probably going to do the same thing and um, same thing with like crags and stuff uh, yeah I think it's really important mm-hmm. uh, a other question from Kyle uh, what's Chloe's favorite crag mm. you might have a favorite crag in Ireland but you know I don't know abroad as well cool. uh, like in Ireland, it kind of has to be Oi, but uh, like I feel like that's kind of cheating because they only discovered it a few months ago. <laughs> before that, uh, before that one was probably the burn. Like it's kind of like the burn's kind of basic, but I really enjoy the like, like a stamina test, like a fitness test. I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, it's, it it'd be between the burn and the fairhead. And I guess if I ultimately had to pick which one I'd go to forever, it'd be fairhead. If I'd pick a one day hit right now, it'd be the burn. But that's because they haven't like haven't done everything in the burn that I want to do. So it's kind of giving you like three crags there. I can't really pick one. <laughs> then favorite crag ever. Oh, that is a hard one. Red rocks in the states. Um, but like to be honest, OE oh, beats all of them, so oh, yeah. mm. I'll just stick with OE, oh, that's it. Okay, <laughs> brilliant, yeah. It looks pretty epic, I would like to get there some someday, one day. <laughs> Did you ever think about yourself that what could I do if I wasn't able to climb or root set or work in the awesome world? Uh, what would you be? Have you got like any other passions or things that you think oh would be cool to actually try or be this person or it would be interesting to do this yeah i've kind of got too many um <laughs> like I'm sorry i didn't hear it i've kind of got like too many things that i'd, I'd like to oh. but uh so in terms of, like hobbies like i really love cycle touring 
I think it's an amazing way to like see places and stuff. I've dabbled on it like a little bit. Um, and if I were to like say, take the best experience of my life, it would be I did like a cycle tour. Well, I attempted a cycle tour around Ireland, and uh, that was that was pretty up there um, in terms of, like there was like a lot of freedom and like timelessness. Uh, in terms of work, I've always loved the idea of getting involved in like humanitarian work or like environmental change or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of find like all of it a bit over, overwhelming at the moment. So, or like I always kind of have, I think that's why I navigated towards climbing. So I don't know if I'll ever, like, I don't think I'll ever be climbing. I just like it too much. So, yeah, that's probably like, there are probably two things that I'd, I'd go to first if I were to go to something. Um, I also like writing a lot, but I don't really do it much. That or like journaling or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. What about coaching climbing? Yeah, so I don't at the moment I don't have any interest in coaching. I like I feel like maybe someday I will, but at the moment it's 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 on the list but it's not like it's not on the list enough for me to do anything with it. But um if I were to go into coaching, um like lifestyle and attitude and stuff is like a really important factor for me in climbing, so if you're if you're not doing it for like enjoying it and for like self improvement and stuff, then there's no point in doing it. So I'd find it really hard to coach someone to climb if their sole purpose is to get better at climbing and their purpose isn't just to become a better person. Um so if I were to go into coaching in the future I think it would kinda of, like it would be necessary for me to like work with people that want kind of like a holistic view of like coaching. I think that's something that I found hard in the past is like yeah, I, just, I don't, I wouldn't be interested in like coaching someone on like how to like, achieve a certain grade or a certain like strength barrier or something. Um, but I, I'm really interested in like the psychological components of it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, attitude and the lifestyle and like what you can gain from it like mentally. That's all like really important to me. But I feel like, I feel like not a lot of people would put a lot of emphasis on that if they were to look for coaching. So I think that's mm-hmm. kind of like, me away from it a little bit mm-hmm. yeah i think that the mental part of coaching and climbing is really important it i think it translates to, to your real life as well and yeah do you think that you know uh, the way you think your own life philosophy translates onto your climbing uh, yeah it does yeah like i always want to keep improving like I'm like really, really self-critical and probably like side out to other people too, just critical in general. But uh, like, which is like good and bad. So I'd apply like that same criticism, like self-criticism from a life into climbing, which is a good thing. Cause if, you, if you're really willing to like look at yourself harshly and stuff, then you can look at your weakness and stuff honestly and, and work on them. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of see them like they're really linked for me. If I'm if I'm having like a rough patch in life, then like my climbing will suffer, and I'm really aware of that. And likewise, if I'm like if I'm going if I'm like really stressed and stuff, then I'm aware that I like I probably need to go climb and like fix it and stuff. So they are really linked. Like yeah, in terms of mentality. I know you're a climber. You're a really good climber. But do you like hill walking? I I love. Hill walking. But kind of lazy too. Uh, like I really enjoy it when I do it. Like a fair weather hill walker. I like you find it hard to get me out in the rain. Like I just if there's a rainy day, I kind of I just want to like tuck in. Um, or go climb inside and stuff. Uh, yeah. But I do like hill walking. I just I love being out in the mountains and being somewhere like remote or nice and stuff. So yeah, like I I would say I'm a hill walker. Just a fair weather hill walker. And I'll enjoy it if I got in the rain. Like, I love a bit of misery and suffering. I'm, like, mm-hmm. definitely not opposed to that. And I really enjoy it when I'm out in it. But, uh, yeah, if it's a rainy day, I'll probably choose to just go train or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason I asked is uh, because um, many of climbers don't really like hill walking. And they only see hill walking as a means to get to the crowd. Kind of, kind of hard to answer it all on the spot, but uh, 
yeah, like one of the main reasons I find is to see places, like to, to be in these beautiful places that mm-hmm. you probably wouldn't be in otherwise. And it's kind of the same to walking, like you just get to be somewhere really nice. So it's like, yeah, so I'm like, generally I just hill walk more so if I'm like injured or a bit burnt out or just don't really feel like climbing, but climbing would generally be like number one for walking. Really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Tanya asked, uh, do you climb in winter? Outside, uh, outside, not so much. I, like, yeah, it'd be hard to get me out in a shot in winter. I just, I don't really enjoy <laughs> it. Like, my hand and feet just go numb and I can't feel the rock. And, mm. like, my climbing partner, Neil, he loves that stuff. Like, he loves going out and not being able to feel his fingers and his toes. And he's like, yeah, it's been suffering. I just, I, I want to be able to climb and focus on the climbing and, be able to like feel what I'm climbing with my hands and fingers. So in winter, uh, I would be inclined to go bouldering or go to Spain. I'd usually like certain like few trips to Spain at least in winter. Um, to train. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so no docky for Chloe in winter. <laughs> it is pretty hard. Yeah, it is. Um, what about uh, like ice climbing or um, ice roads? Have you ever tried it? I have, uh, so I've dabbled. I would never call myself an ice or an alpine climber yet, but I have dabbled. And I definitely want to go down that route at some stage, but not yet. So I've been to Rook and I've been ice climbing. Um, and yeah, it was terrifying, but great. And I've been, I didn't know it twice, basically. So I've been to Rook and, and I've been to Chamonix, but the year I was there, we were there for like, five or six weeks and it rained for like four weeks. It was really bad weather. Mm-hmm. We did the, I can't even remember what route we did. Um, we did some routes that involved snow and ice and crampons. So it was great. But uh, it's kind of something where I feel like, um, obviously the, the body is kind of naturally inclined towards like strength-based sports when you're a bit younger. So at the moment I'm really keen to focus on like bouldering and sport climbing and then I feel like trad climbing and alpine climbing and stuff I think I'll be able to like engage with that for like a really long time so I'm kind of happy to just put it on like a back burner for now and enjoy like because I'm not really interested in like working on all disciplines climbing. Raj has a question for the feather in the west was it distracting having someone filming you when you climbed? Not a bit. I think he missed the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I was just saying at the start that uh, I didn't even notice them. Uh, in that particular situation, anyway, I was totally focused on the climbing, and they were really impressive. Like, if you're to go out with maybe some amateur film makers and photographers, maybe it would be a bit distracting, but um, the guys at Cold House, like, they were just unnoticeable, like, and they were so nice. So we got really lucky, like they were, they, they were really good at what they did. That's why like the film, like I think anyone that was in it climbing, we all felt like we didn't really do anything, we just climbed, we, like we were just there. But the guys that made it, like what they did is really impressive. So the film is like really good and it reflects, it reflects them and what they put into it. So no, just because of them, I didn't notice it. But if it was someone else, then maybe it would have, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? Okay, silly question. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Movie? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a hard one. I just watched a Truman Show the other day. That's always been one of my favorite movies. Uh, the, the Green Mile. I'm going to have to list out a few and then kind of like... Oh, it's a, it's a tough one, the Green Mile. Oh my God. The, the Green Mile is, is pretty up there. I think that's it. Pretty, yeah, okay. Pretty amazing movie. Um, I don't know, like I love Lord of the Rings and all those movies. I like the Avengers movies. Um, I really like top provoking movies. I like, like, yeah. What about friends? Are they all climbers or do you have friends or do, have you got non climbing friends? Uh, pretty much all climbers. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's kind of it. I find it, I think I, I do find it really hard to. I find it really hard to converse with people that aren't climbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like really hard. 
but uh, weight climber is pretty easy. It's kind of just a personality thing though. Like I don't, I don't interact with a lot of climbers because I with, with a lot of non climbers because I spend so much time in the climbing environment. Like I work at a climb wall, and I work there and I chat to a lot of climbers. And then when I'm not working, I spend a lot of time there, also chatting to a lot of climbers. And then I'll spend my other time like out at a crag or a mountain, also chatting to climbers. So I don't really, yeah, I just don't really meet a lot. Of yeah. Um, Possibly also doesn't really have much opportunities to actually meet people from outside yeah. of climbing. Yeah. You are a musician as well. You play guitar. I, I definitely want to call it music. I like, I've tried to dabble. I've dabbled at the guitar since I was like 16, but I've been, I was really bad at it for like two or four years. And then, uh, I spend a bit, a lot of time with like people that are really good at it, and I, I can't really learn songs. I have no rhythm or anything, but I just really enjoy like noodling, you know, just mm -hmm. doing stuff. But it's very like on and off sort of thing where I'll say it for a while and I'll get kind of good at it, and then I'll stop saying it and then I get bad at it. But yeah, it's kind of, it's actually like it's a kind of a sad goal, but it's like it's on my list of goals to be able to play a song, and it has been for like three years, and I still can't. <laughs> Someday. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in the future, like near future? Near future, like five years or Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know, like so you know the oh oh I just thought of my favourite movie, Into the Wild. I used to love mm -hmm. Into the Wild when I was a teenager, that was like that was how I wanted to go about life. But uh like uh cabin in Alaska, that was what I used to always want. But kind of like I could like dial that down to a cabin in Ireland somewhere off grid, that would be great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, I I don't really enjoy thinking too far ahead because I feel like it can just get stressful. Um, yeah. Because if you think too far ahead and you're not like obviously not enjoying what you're doing is time and stuff and it's really easy to fall into a trap of like Oh, I'll work really hard now and it'll pay off in like five or ten years, but like you don't even know if you'll be here in five or ten years. Um, so I kind of like try to keep a check on not while also like trying to like be aware that like I'm not always going to want to do what I want to do. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, w I would like to like buy a really run down cottage in the next like ten years maybe and like renovate it all from scratch and go live somewhere and have like my own garden and all that sort of stuff. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. The biggest struggle or failure or anything that you, yeah, the toughest thing in your life, um, it can be in climbing, it can be in life, something that, you know, uh, is deep in your mind. Um, oh, that's a heavy question. But, uh, if you can when share, I, you know. When I was in college, they found it really hard. So when I went to college, um, I was like just totally out of my depth, I think. Uh, I didn't really enjoy what I was doing and I was in this like massive place with loads of people and I felt like I wasn't making friends. And while I was like experiencing all that, I like, I found climbing and I was like, this is the best thing ever. And then uh, like a couple of months in, like I've kind of mentioned it a few times, I feel now. Um, just in like different conversations but like yeah like I had a fracture to my back and it, it was like a really big deal to me I had like a back brace on for like three months and I couldn't I couldn't like bend or twist or like wash myself or anything and I kind of had like a total like mental crisis of like how to like deal with myself um, and after all that happened uh, I found it really hard to get back into college because everything just felt really pointless it was like I kind of saw what I wanted to do. I wanted to go climb, and like it was like I couldn't use my body while I was in this brace. And I was like, all I want to do is use my body. I want to go like see places and do things. So when I started getting better, I was like in like a massive rush to get back to like doing those things. And I was really conflicted because I was in this thing. I was studying physics, and I saw the like practicality of doing it. And I did find it interesting to a degree, but it wasn't really like what I wanted to do. It felt like a waste of time to me. So I'd have to be like inside at a computer for like 
10 hours a day really and worked on it non-stop and it was really really conflicting and it took me quite a while to like to realize what was going on in my head I was like really unhappy and to accept that you're unhappy and why you're unhappy and to make it to make the decision to change it that was really hard so you know like you go to college and if you decide it's not it's not for you that it's not something you want and you've got to go back to like your family and say like actually I know you thought like this was a really good thing but I like really don't like it and I've no idea what I'm going to do with my life but I have to do something different and that's like a really hard thing to do and mm -hmm. I think if you haven't done it it's hard to understand how hard it is to do but I would say that that was like the biggest obstacle and just the whole like the whole back thing I was like I was in like it's constant like back pain for like a couple of years and stuff and it all kind of like tied in together it's like a really tough couple of years but I felt like once I started moving out of it and they got out the other side that like I felt like a much stronger and better person so like I'd never change the fact that any of it happened like it was a really hard couple of years but I feel like I grew a lot from it and now there's like very little that happens that I feel like I can't deal with so, mm -hmm. Probably is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's really important. That's really beautiful what you said. <laughs> the hardship and uh, being outside of the comfort of the world as well. Uh, it's, it's also kind of really important to like take control of like your own happiness mm -hmm. and like life and stuff. There's so things going on in autopilot not think about what you're doing or how you're feeling. It's more like constantly assess like, are you happy with like how you're spending your time and stuff? And I think that was like the biggest thing I've learned in the past couple of years is that like, regardless of what you're doing, you need to like, make sure that like, you're happy doing that. And if you're not, then you need to like, not just be aware of it, but you need to like, make a decision even if it's really hard to change it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so Chloe, thank you so much for uh, for your words and for your time um, have a lovely evening Eva said thank you so much very interesting chat thank you so much Eva Jane said thank you this was really interesting good observation and very open and honest thank you so much Chloe I think we all need it so Kyle uh, I'll see you Chloe on the wall of pray at the weekend thanks and Ambrose <laughs> cheers guys thanks Ambrose <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. See you soon. Bye-bye.